This is Crystal Arnold. And Crystal and Jesse and their family have been coming since before we went to youth camp. And uh, a few Sundays ago, Crystal decided that she wanted to rededicate her life to Christ. Crystal, have you asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior? Yes. Do you desire to be baptized today? Yes. Well, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. You can sit on your knees. There you go. Well, everybody can see you. All right. This is Jules Arnold. Jules, is Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior? Yes. Do you desire to be baptized today? Yes. Amen. Well, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. And today, um, was, we're going to pick up in Genesis 44 if you want to turn there. But uh, we've been covering the story of uh, Jacob and Joseph and his sons. And uh, they had, uh, there was a long famine that was going to happen. Uh, it would be, first, there would be seven years of abundance. There would be seven years of famine following that. And so uh, after much lingering, procrastinating, yes, I forgot to mention again, if you kids would like to go to Children's Church, uh, y'all can go back there now. There's kids back there, uh, adults back there ready to receive you. If you want to stay in church, you're more than welcome to do that too. But uh, after much lingering, procrastinating, and waiting, Jacob and his sons were almost out of grain. So they had let this famine linger on for so long, uh, they were about to run out of grain. He did everything he could to protect his youngest son, Benjamin, uh, because he, Joseph was his favorite son. He lost Joseph, and so... Now the, he, he is holding on to Benjamin, his other son, and so he's just watching after him with all his might, protecting him in every way possible. But necessity to survive forced his hand that he was going to have to send his sons to Egypt to get more grain. The famine had lasted so long, they probably thought it was just a short season. We're going through a bad time. They thought maybe it's going to end pretty soon, uh, but they had no idea that this famine was going to last seven years. So he had no choice to send his sons back to Egypt for more food. And they came uh, in contact with the man who was second in charge of the whole country of Egypt. And they had no idea that it was his brother, Joseph, who was second in command of all of Egypt. He knew them, but they did not know him. It had been almost 21 years since he had seen them. Uh, and so back then, 21 years ago, they despised him and hated him so much that they wanted him dead. They, they couldn't stand him because he was annoying. It was a little brother who was always uh, got to sleep in while they went and worked and worked out in the fields. And then his father would send him out to supervise. And so they couldn't stand him and they wanted him dead. But instead of killing him, they decided to sell him. And so they sold him into slavery. Um, so I know we covered a lot during that time over the last several weeks. And if you want to catch up, you can catch up on our YouTube channel. Some of these sermons are on Facebook if you want to watch those and get up to speed. But we're going to fast forward many years now to where we are and, and, and right before chapter 44. And so Joseph, their brother who they sold into slavery, is now second command of all of Egypt. And he's in charge of all of the food in Egypt that's being distributed to everyone who needs it. So they went to Egypt the first time. It was a 300, like 300 miles they traveled by horse or camel or walking. So it took them, this was no short journey. It's not like just walking to the end of the driveway and back. This was a long drawn out thing that took them time to go and do. So now they have gone back a second time for food uh, because they waited so long that they ran out of food again. And uh, Simeon, their brother, is in prison in Egypt until they return. And so it was important that they go back to release him 
but because their father was so protective of Benjamin, he wouldn't let them go. So they arrived in Egypt expecting to be in trouble because of uh, some money that they had given in there. Like the, when you have a sack that you get your grain in, they put their money in that sack. They would hand their sack to the officials in Egypt. They would fill that sack with grain, take your money out for payment, and send you on your way. But they had actually put their money back in their sacks. So when they discovered this, they were, I mean, the Bible says their hearts failed them. Like their hearts stopped because they were just so afraid of what was going to happen to them because like, how in the world did this money get back in our sack? <laughs> what are we going to do? We're going to be accused of stealing. They had already been accused of being spies earlier. And so they, now they're being accused of stealing. He, they were afraid that was what was going to happen. So um, they go back to Egypt and when they get in Egypt, to their surprise, they don't get in trouble. I mean, they're quick to spill the beans. They walk up to the steward of Joseph's house and they're like, hey man, I got something to tell you. Like when we got, when we left here last time, y'all were supposed to take our money and we were on our way home and we opened our sack and well, the money that we were supposed to pay you, it's in our sack. We, we, didn't, we don't know how it got there. We didn't steal it. I don't know. And the steward's like, it's cool. It's okay. Lord, the God of your fathers, your God has blessed you financially. I got your money and I put it back in your sack. And they were like, whoo, Lordy. I thought we were all fixing to die. And so he takes them into their house to have a meal together. They weren't in trouble. They were reunited with Simeon. And now they're about to head back home with more grain and all the brothers. And so this is where we pick up in chapter 44. They just had their meal. They ate with Joseph. Joseph sat at a separate table because people in Egypt segregated themselves from other countries. And so they, um, they, if Joseph couldn't even eat with other Egyptians because Joseph is actually a Hebrew, right? But he has learned the Egyptian way. And because Pharaoh saw the spirit of God in him, he gave him power to be second command of all of Egypt. So he was in command of all of Pharaoh's stuff because of his character and the kind of guy that he was and what God had instilled in him. And so in spite of all that he'd been through, God blessed Joseph. And so here he is, second command of all of Egypt. His brothers just had a meal. They're all married. They're fixing to head home and they're rejoicing because they got Simeon with them and they got their grain. Their father's going to be so happy because they're bringing Benjamin back home with them. So chapter 44, I read these first two verses to you last week as a cliffhanger. And this week we're going to reread those and discuss them for just a second. Verse one of chapter 44 says, now Joseph gave these instructions to the steward of his house. Fill the men's sacks with as much food as they can carry. Put each man's silver in the mouth of his sack and then put my cup, the silver one, in the mouth of the youngest one's sack along with the silver for his grain. And he did as Joseph said. So the first time they came, Joseph had his steward do almost the same thing with one minor twist. The first time they came, they put their silver back in their pouch. What do they do this time? He puts their silver right back in their pouch, the silver they were supposed to buy grain with. And then the little twist is, he says, put my silver cup, my silver cup that is, that is valuable, that is mine, it belongs to the second command of all of Egypt, put that in the youngest one's pouch. This is kind of, this is kind of a setup, right? I mean, it just looks like how they're entrapping him. Uh, this, if this was, this is Roscoe P. Coltrane speed trap if I ever saw one. I mean, he, he has got them, he's got them pegged. He's fixing to set them up. And so they, uh, as they leave here, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're happy. They're having a great time. But the first time he did this with a silver, he did it to bless them. He did it also to test them to see if these were really the same brothers that they were 21 years ago. Has anything changed in their hearts in this 21 years, uh, living with the guilt and the stuff that they felt inside of them? Has anything changed? And so when you're heavy with guilt, it's hard to see good things as blessings from God. Because when these brothers found this money in their sack the first time, they were like, God, what have you done to us? What have you done to us? Why, why is this happening? This is horrible. And I told y'all a few weeks ago that like if I find a pair of pants that's got $20 in it before I put it in the laundry, I'm like, woohoo! 
This is a great thing. It's hard to see God's blessings as blessings when you're ridden with guilt. And these boys have been carrying a heavy load of guilt for 21 years. And so they were feeling guilty about their past. And they were thinking they were going to get in grave trouble because of this. And here again, they get ready to leave to go home. These guys have just had a great meal. The man in Egypt was really nice to them. They didn't throw them in jail. I mean, he gave them their brother back. They're headed home. And, and now Joseph again com commands them to put their money back in their sack, put the cup back in his sack, in his sack and hide it. And then we pick up in verse three. As morning dawned, the men were sent on their way with their donkeys. They had not gone far from the city when Joseph said to his steward, go after those men at once. And when you catch up with them, say to them, why have you repaid good with evil? Isn't this the cup my master drinks from and also uses for divination? This is a wicked thing you have done. When he caught up with them, he repeated these words to them. But they said to him, why does my Lord say such things? Far be it from your service to do anything like that. We even brought back to you from the land of Canaan the silver we found inside the mouth of our sacks. So why would we steal silver and gold from your master's house? If any of your servants is found to have it, he will die. And the rest of us will become my Lord's slaves. So they started on their way home. They're happy. They're merry. They're joking. They're having a good time. Things have gone well. And then all of a sudden they hear these horses coming up behind them and this, these horses surround them and overtake them. And they're like, stop. The commander of Egypt demands you stop immediately. I mean, that's kind of what I imagine would happen. And they're like, this cannot be good. We're in so much trouble now. I don't know what's happened where we're doing good, but this is not good. And the steward says to them, why have you repaid good with evil? Where is my master's silver cup? This is a wicked thing that you have done. So these brothers have been caught in Joseph's trap. They've been caught. None of them know what the, that they have the silver cup in their sack. They're being wrongfully accused. We know that. And you might think, well, Joseph is wrong for abusing his power and authority over them like this. That's just plain cruel. Why would he do that? But I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's the case here. Given the character of Joseph and his dependence upon God, I believe that Joseph's, Joseph's actions are being guided, guided by God's righteous hand. I really do. I believe that his actions are being guided by God's righteous hand. And God knew exactly what was needed to bring these men to repentance. He, he knew exactly what they needed to hear. He knew what strings to pull and he knew just how to do it. That's how God knows the inner side of our heart. He knows us like nobody else. He knows what you think. He knows your, your thoughts every day. He knows the things you think wrong, the things you think good. He knows what you do, what you don't do. And he knew these men's hearts. So after being accused, Joseph's brother said, why do my Lord, does my Lord say such things? Far be it from your servants to do anything like that. It's very humble. Like We're your servants. We're, we're saying that we will do what you ask. We're not going to steal from you. We even brought back the silver that you, that you put back in our sacks the first time. We didn't have to do that. We were trying to show that we are honest people, honest men, normal men from everyday life. Why would we ever steal from your master's house? Now, y'all remember I told y'all last week about James 1.19. My dear brothers and sisters, that's what the scripture says in James 1 19. My brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. So they did good on the slow to become angry. They didn't blow up. I mean, they kind of spoke some truth to them, to, to the steward. But verse 9, they, they still need to work a little bit on being slow to speak. Because I don't think I'd have blurted out what they did in verse 9. Verse 9, he says, I tell you what, if any of your servants is found to have this, you can kill them. You know what? The rest of us will be your slaves. That's how sure they were that they didn't have this cup. Now, I don't know how to spoke out that soon because, I mean, you just never know. I mean, you never know. But this goes to show you that these brothers trusted one another. They trusted one another. They were confident that none of them took the cup. I mean, if they didn't trust each other, what were they going to do? They were going to look around and go, all right, which one of y'all's got it? Come on. Which one of you got it? Spit it out. Open your bag. Let me see it. Where's it at? 
I know you got it. I mean, I know some, some of y'all be pointing your brother and sister out. You know which one had it. Y'all be like, Wade, give me that. I, I, know, I know you got it, dude. Come on. Arrest him. I know he's got it. He's the one. I know it. He's always tricking people. It's him. Some of y'all would be calling your brother and sister out, I know. But they trusted each other. They knew none of them took it. And these guys were so sure that none of them had it that, like, if one of us got it, that person's going to die. And the rest of us will be your slaves. That's pretty sure. That's being pretty confident. Verse 10 through 16. Very well, then he said, let it be as you say. Whoever is found to have it will become my slave. The rest of you will be free from blame. Each of them quickly lowered his sack to the ground and opened it, and the steward proceeded to search, beginning with the oldest and ending with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. At this they tore their clothes. Then they all loaded their donkeys and returned to the city. And Joseph was still in the house when Judah and his brothers came in, and they threw themselves to the ground before him. Joseph said to them, what is this you have done? Don't you know that a man like me can find things out by divination? What can we say to my Lord? Judah replied. What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered your servant's guilt. We are now my Lord's slaves. We ourselves and the one who has found to have the cup. Joseph's stewards, his steward, knowing they were falsely accused, he knew that they were falsely accused. He had set this trap since he himself planted the cup, and he probably thought, well, that escalated quickly since you've already offered somebody to die if they got the cup, and the rest of you, the rest of you are going to be slaves. All right, let it be as you say. But then he says, the one who has the cup will be left as a slave. Now, I don't think that Joseph's steward wanted to draw them to so much anger by saying that they were going to kill Benjamin. That's what, the, that's what he offered. He said, you can kill whoever has the cup. But I don't think Joseph Stewart wanted to make them rise to a level that they would want to draw, shed blood in defense of Benjamin. And we all know that they're capable of that because we've seen what happened in Shechem, right? Many, many, many chapters ago, we saw where Joseph's sons went into Shechem and killed every man in the village for what they had done to their sister. So it was possible that these guys could be rose to anger and he didn't want to do that. So he says, let it be as you say, the one that's found to have it will become my slave. The rest of you will be free from blame. That's what the steward said. And so notice that very quickly or speedily, they let down their sacks to the ground very fast. They didn't hesitate. They, they let them down to the ground for inspection. It says quickly they did it. They didn't hesitate because they knew they were innocent. They opened their sacks and the steward, the steward proceeded to search their bags. And it, it doesn't mention it, but I wonder how many of the brothers noticed as their bags hit the ground that they heard silver jingle in their packs. It doesn't say anything about that, but can you imagine being accused of stealing and they're searching your bags and they see those silver coins in your bag and you're seeing them because they just opened your bag and you're like, oh man, there's silver in my bag. Holy cow, how'd that get in there? So they're already looking for something, a silver cup that they're being accused of stealing and they open this bag and they see the coins. That's stress, that's high stress. That reminds me of being at the baggage claim at the airport. You know, I'm like, I, you go through and they check all your bags and I'm just, I hunt a lot during the fall and I'm like, man, please don't let there be a stray bullet or a knife or something I didn't find in the little hideaway pocket or something from a hunting trip. I mean, you don't want them going there and find that because then you're going back there and you're getting fully searched, which, which now I have a knee replacement. So they're gonna frisk me anyways because uh, they'll set off the detectors. But that's stress, and these guys are having a stressful moment as they search through this bag to find this cup and they see the coins in there. Had to be a very tense, stressful moment. Luckily for these boys, he didn't have to frisk them. He knew right where the cup was. He lined them up in order of oldest to youngest and started with the oldest and went down all the bags and opened them one by one. Didn't find the cup, didn't find the cup, didn't find the cup until he gets to the youngest one, little Benji. And then, well, 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 what have we here? I found the boss's cup in your sack. Looky here, keep, keep, keep government stuffing, boys. I mean, he's found this in his pack and he is like, they're, they're done for. The planted evidence had been found. The favorite son, it would, would appear, was going to be in some grave trouble. And what they were going to tell their, what were they gonna tell their father? 
How are we going to explain this to dad that Benjamin is now going to be a slave in Egypt, the one that our father swore that we must protect? And, I, and Judah gave, he swore his life that he would protect him and bring him home. And now he's going to be imprisoned. 21 years ago, these same brothers hated the favorite son of Jacob at that time, Joseph. They were glad to get rid of him, but they were not so glad about what was happening now, 21 years later, to the next favorite son. And they expressed their grief as they ripped their clothes in grief, as if someone had died. This was not what these brothers wanted to hear. This was the worst thing imaginable that could happen to them. Benjamin was going to now likely be a slave in Egypt, or worse, even dead. Because what did they say? Whoever has the cup, he will die. You can kill him. Their little brother. And they were devastated. But notice what these brothers did. They didn't argue. What'd they do? They loaded up their donkeys and they went back into the city to see the king. Most of us would have been like, there's no way. I, we did not do this. No, I'm being, somebody's planted evidence in my bag. This did not happen. I did not deserve this. I did not steal that cup. There is no way. You're staging us. You're, you're making this whole thing up. I know Benjamin didn't steal that. None of us would have done that. But they didn't. This time they hushed their mouth. And they waited. They loaded up their stuff, went back to the city. This was quite a change for these brothers from 21 years ago. Many years ago, they sold their brother. They lied to their father. They told him that a wild animal drug him off. They even killed an animal and put the animal's blood on his robe, the robe that his father had made him because he was his favorite son. And they showed it to him and said, look, an animal just mauled him and killed him and drug him off. This is all we found. He's gone. They didn't care about Joseph. They didn't care about Joseph's feelings as he was rejected by his family and hauled off by slave traders. They didn't care about lying to their father and telling him that his favorite son was dead. 21 years ago, these boys did not care, but now the idea of hurting their father and losing their little brother made them feel horrible as if someone had just died. These were not the same brothers as before. And we see this as they fall on their face in humility, fulfilling the dream yet again that Joseph had that his brothers would bow down before him. This is the third time they bow before him and they fall to their face on the ground in humility. These boys have been wrong. This evidence had been planted, but they came humbly. They didn't demand justice. They weren't pleading their case, but they pleaded for mercy. They pleaded for mercy. And Joseph angrily asked them, what is this you have done? Don't you know that a man like me can find out things by divination? Divination was a thing that, of Egyptian culture. And we've heard about it even in, in, in Laban's life, Jacob's father-in-law. But Joseph was playing the part here for just a little while longer. He was second command of all of Egypt. He needed them to know it. He needed them to believe that he was who he said he was. And many ancients in those days, they used sacred cups as divination devices. Like I said, Jacob's father-in-law, Laban, he used idols that he had in his house for divination. Because when Jacob left the farm to go back to Bethel, his wife, unknowingly to Jacob, took his, her father's idols. And they believed that he could use those idols to find them through divination practices. And so Joseph was aware of this culture. He knew what they did. He learned their culture. He learned their ways. And yeah, it's possible he could have used divination, but I don't think he did. I don't think it's likely. I think he's making this story believable to these boys so that they could say, how did you even know we had the cup? Well, don't you know I can use divination? That's what he did. And so I, Joseph had access to a much higher power than anything created by idols or divination. He had access to the power of God. God's spirit was within him. God gave him the ability to interpret dreams. God led him through all the times of all the years of his life that he was going through difficult times and elevated him to the second highest place in all of Egypt. He didn't need divination. All he needed was God. Once again, now the older, more mature Judah speaks out. Last week, he stepped up when his father said, all right, we're running out of food. It's time to go get more grain. And Judah's like, we're not going to Egypt unless you send Benjamin with us. 
That man, the second command of Egypt, he told us that we will not see his face if we don't bring Benjamin. So if you want us to go to Egypt, we're taking Benjamin. If we're not taking Benjamin, no, we're not going. He told him, he said, we could have already been there and back twice if you would have sent us when we first came home. But we waited till we're out of food. And now, once again, Judah steps up and speaks out. He's not arguing his innocence necessarily. He's not accusing them of foul play or playing the evidence. But rather, in verse 16, he says, What can we say, my Lord? What can we say? How can we prove our innocence? He, God has uncovered our servant's guilt. We are now, my Lord, slaves. We ourselves are the one who was found with the cup. Not Benjamin, we. All of us were found with the cup. Judah reveals in this verse that God has done some great work in the hearts of these brothers over the years. He really has. His statement is that they are not going to leave their younger brother and walk away like they did 21 years ago when they walked away from Joseph, Joseph as he was drug off by slave traders. They were going to stick by him this time. Notice he says, God has found out the iniquity of your servants, or God has found out your servant's guilt. You say, well, what guilt? They didn't take the cup. They didn't steal it. It was wrongfully placed there. So what guilt do they have in their life? You're right. They didn't take the cup. But they were guilty of far, far worse in their lifetime. They were guilty of far worse far greater sins. Sometimes we take pride in the fact that we're not guilty of certain sins. You realize that? Sometimes you look at other people and you go, well, at least I don't act like that guy. At least I don't go out and do drugs. At least I don't go out and, and drink alcohol all the time. At least I don't go out and do this. At least I don't watch that stuff on TV. I'm not like that guy. We are prideful about things that we don't take part in when all the while we are guilty of far greater sins. You know, the Bible says to remove the pluck from your, the, the, the stick from your own eye before you start trying to pluck one out of somebody else's eye. We all have far greater problems. You cannot hide from your sin. The, and, and you've heard people say time heals all wounds. Time does not heal all wounds, as people often say, nor does time relieve the guilt of sin in your life. Only the blood of Jesus can relieve the guilt of sin in your life. That's it. Time will not do. These boys had spent 21 years carrying this guilt of what they've done to their brother, and it ain't healed a thing. And it's about to come to surface today as they meet the second command of, of, of Egypt. Now they know what is happening to them in this moment is because of the sin and the guilt that they've carried in their life this whole time that they have not sought forgiveness for. Some people say a, a guilty conscience is a bad thing. I could say, yeah, a guilty conscience, it can be a bad thing, but a guilty conscience can also be a good thing. Because the guilty conscience is, what leading, is what's leading these boys to forgiveness and repentance. And a guilty conscience can lead all of us to repentance if we choose to let it take us there. But if you want to keep on carrying it, guess what? You're going to keep on carrying it till the day you die. But if you want to give it up to Jesus, you can have forgiveness today. I'd be more, far more worried about somebody who went through life every day and did not care about how they did things in their life wrong or how they sinned time and time again. I'd be far more worried about that than somebody who had, did not have a conscience, that didn't have, than does have a conscience. Guilt does need to be dealt with. We, we, we are guilty of a lot of things. And the only way we can really deal with our guilt is to confess our sin before God and seek forgiveness. And I want you to look at what Joseph says in reply to Judah's words. So he, he asked him, he says, how can we prove our innocence? In verse 17, he says, Joseph said, far be it from me to do such a thing. Only the man who was found to have the cup will become my slave. The rest of you can go back to your father in peace. This is not good. 
This is not what they needed. They, how are they going to go home and explain this to their father? They didn't want to hear this claim as keeping Benjamin as a slave and sending them home without him. This will never, ever work. They had to go to great lengths to convince their father to even let Benjamin come back to Egypt with them. And now he's going to be stuck as a slave. Judah guaranteed Benjamin's life that he would bring him home. He would make sure of it and be returned home safely. And I want you to look at how Judah handles this in the rest of the chapter. Judah went up to him, meaning Joseph or Zephaneth Paneah, as they know him in Egypt. And he said, please, my Lord, let your servant speak a word to my Lord. Do not be angry with your servant. Though you're equal to Pharaoh himself, my Lord asked his servants, do you have a father or a brother? And we answered, we have an aged father and there's a young son born to him and his old age, his brother is dead and he's the only one of his mother's sons left and his father loves him. And then you said to your servants, bring him down to me so I can see him for myself. And we said to my Lord, the boy cannot leave his father. If he leaves him, his father will die. But you told your servants, unless your youngest brother comes down with you, you will not see my face again. When we went back to your servant, my father, we told him what the Lord had said. And then our father said, go back and buy a little more food. But we said, we cannot go down. Only if our youngest brother is with us, we will go. We cannot see the man's face unless our youngest brother is with us. Your servant, my father said to us, you know that my wife bore me two sons. One of them went away from me. And he's talking about Joseph there. And I said, he has surely been torn to pieces and I have not seen him since. If you take this one from me too and harm comes to him, you will bring my gray head down to the grave in misery. So now, if the boy is not with us, when I go back to your servant, my father, and if my father, whose life is closely bound up with this boy's life, sees the boy isn't there, he will die. Your servants will bring the gray head of our father down to the grave in sorrow. Your servant guaranteed the boy's safety to my father. I said, if I do not bring him back to you, I will bear the blame before you, my father, all my life. Now then, please... Let your servant remain here as my Lord's slave in place of the boy and let the boy return with his brothers. How can I go back to my father if the boy's not with me? No, do not let me see the misery that would come upon my father. Now this is probably one of the most moving, heartfelt, passionate, desperate pleas a man could give to the second command of Egypt. It's straightforward. There's no excuses, no claims of innocence, even though they are wrongly accused of this. He is just giving a humble response, an appeal. He doesn't want to anger this Egyptian leader any more than he has to, and already, any more than he already is, and he presented only the facts of what transpired. I told you guys a few weeks ago, anything in life you can say, what are the facts, what is true, and what does God's word say about it? We can apply that to any situation in life. What are the facts? What is true? And what does God's word say about it? Well, he stuck to what is true and what are the facts in this, in this instance. And he presented those facts here. He laid out what happened and was honest as he could. He was hoping to sway this Egyptian leader by telling him, hey man, this all started with you questioning us. And he did it in a nice way. He didn't say, it's your fault. No, he said, this is what happened. Let me explain it to you. We just wanted to be, we just wanted to buy grain. We're starving. It's a famine. We're going to die if we don't get grain. And you accused us when we came here of being spies. And we expressed to you, no, sir, we're not. We're just normal guys from a normal family with a father and a young brother at home. And we are in need of food. We answered truthfully. And then you asked us to bring our younger brother down here as proof. And we knew that my father was not going to let that happen. It's his favorite son. He's already lost one son, and now he's not going to lose another. He loves him. He's trying to protect him. You see, he lost his first son that he loved many, many years ago. And you told us that if we did not bring our youngest son with us, that we would not see your face. And we would not be able to free Simeon from prison. And we told you, we can't bring him here to see you. Because our father ain't going to let him go. He's not. But nonetheless, you said, we must bring him if we want to see Simeon again. So we told our father, your servant. Notice he keeps saying, your servant. Our father, your servant. We told him what happened when we got home. And he was grieved. And he says, the whole world is against me. You're not, you're not going to bring Benjamin back. But eventually, well, guess what? We ran out of food. And we were forced to come. Necessity drove us here. 
Nothing will grow at home. We're in a famine. And my father finally told us he should go buy more grain. And I looked at my father and I told him, I said, no, not unless you send Benjamin with us. If you send Benjamin with us, we'll go. But if you don't, I guess we'll all just starve. Is pretty much what he told him. Our father replied, you know that my wife only bore two sons. They were my favorite. And then Jacob even told him that they were his only two sons. Well, guess what? He had 12. They're all, they're all stepsons, but he only, he played so much favoritism that these were the only two sons he considered he had. And these boys had suffered some deep hurt over that over the years of always coming less than first to their father. But you know my wife bore me two sons. One of them went away from me. He's dead. He's torn to pieces. I've not seen him since. If you take this one from me and harm comes to him, you will bring my gray head down to the grave. I will die if something happens to this son. So I'll tell you this, my Lord, is what Judah told Joseph. Because if the boy is not with us when I return home to your servant, my father, who is closely connected to this boy's life, once he sees that that boy is not with us, my father will die because he loves this boy that much. And I told him, I pledged my life that I would guarantee his safety while he's here. And if I don't bring him back safely, I will bear the shame before you and my father. Please let me, this is Judah talking, please let me, your servant, stay here. Remain as my Lord's slave in this place, in place of the boy and let the boy return with his brothers and go home. I'll take his place. I'll pay the debt that he owes. Do not let me see the misery that would come upon my father for this. Judah did not want to see the misery that would befall upon Jacob. He had seen it 21 years ago. He saw the misery and he did not want to see it again. And he had lied to Jacob about Joseph's disappearance many years ago. He saw how bad it hurt him. And these brothers, they have suffered a lot of years of hurt because of coming in second to those other two boys. But what I see here is a changed heart in Judah. I see a changed heart. He had matured. I mean, he... He had spent many years in guilt and shame over what he had done, but he had matured, he had kids, he had a family. And kids, I mean, kids have a way of making dads see things differently. We really do. And, and our hearts become softer. And I ain't gonna lie, I tear up a lot more than I used to. They have a way of doing that, but he had matured. God had been working on him over all these years and all of his brothers. Many years had passed, and I believe these brothers regretted what they'd done to Joseph. And they didn't know how to get over it. Judah last week stepped up. This week he steps up and he offers himself as surety for the boy. He did this for the sake of his family. He stepped up for the sake of his family. 20 years ago, this guy would not have done that. He had an opportunity 20 years ago, 21 years ago, and he didn't do it. He's not the same guy he was 21 years ago. He's a different man. He's making a huge sacrifice for the sake of other people. Now, there are times in all of our lives, in all of our families, your immediate family, your extended family, that maybe some of us need to step up to the plate. There are times in every one of our families and every one of our lives that we need to step up to the plate and do what's best for your family if that family's going to survive. That's what Judah did here. He stepped up so that his family could survive. There's always mixed feelings. There's always mixed emotions and opinions. Every one of these brothers probably had a different opinion. There was probably some brothers who wanted to lash out and just grab that little guy, the Egyptian official by the neck, but they kept quiet. Everybody has mixed emotions, mixed feelings. There are times of conflict, times of differing opinions and differences, but someone is always needed to step up and make a decision or make a sacrifice to help the family move forward and survive for every one of us. And sometimes that might mean that you being the person that has to step up, if you're that person that you might even have to suffer yourself sometimes. Judah was willing to suffer for his family. He was willing to be a slave for the rest of his life in Egypt and let his brothers go free. 
He didn't do that for his own benefit. And when we step up in our family, we don't do it for our own benefit. We do it because it's the best thing for the family. We step up because it's the best thing for the family. This is even true in relationships to marriage. Uh, and, and, and sometimes the husband needs to step up to the plate and be the bigger person and be the spiritual leader of the home. Husband, you may need to be the first to admit that you're wrong. Yeah, that's tough, ain't it? You may be the first person to admit that you're wrong and admit that you're, you have faults if you want your family to survive. Sometimes the woman or the wife needs to step up and be the, step up to the plate in marriage and be the one who starts the healing process and say, I'm sorry, I did this wrong. Maybe you need to be the one to step up first. It may not be exactly the way you like it, but if you can't be that kind of person that ever steps up to the plate, then guess what? They can't depend on you. If you can't be the kind of person to step up to the plate first, they can't depend on you. You need to step up for your marriage. You need to step up for your kids. You need to step up for your siblings. They need you. They need to be able to depend on you. We can't be selfish. We can't be embarrassed. We cannot be afraid. We have to be bold enough to take the initiative to stand up for our family and defend them, to protect them, and sometimes suffer for them just like Judah did. You know what that's called? Love. Love for one another. Do you love your family enough that you would offer yourself as Judah did and become a slave so that they can be free? I know some of y'all are thinking about your brothers and sisters are going, that one, no, this one, yeah, that one, no, no. Judah made a huge sacrifice here out of love. It was heroic self-sacrifice. After he laid out the whole story to Joseph, exactly as it happened, he didn't say, so what if I propose to you that uh, you can just keep waiting and Aiden over there and because uh, I know they're always up to no good and you can keep them and all the rest of us will go free. He didn't do that. He said, take me. Let me stay in his place. I will take the punishment so myself so that they can be free. I'm just picking on y'all today. You know that, right? That kind of sacrifice sounds real familiar, don't it? That somebody would take your place. That's what Jesus did. He took your place. Someone that loved you so much that he offered himself as a sacrifice. He bled and he died on the cross for your sin. And guess what? Jesus wasn't selective. He didn't say, well, I'll die for that group, but I ain't dying for that group. I'll die for that sinner, but I ain't dying for that sinner. I'll die for these guys in the front, but the ones in the back, no, they're too dirty. It's too much sin. No, I'm not dying for those people. He was not selective at all. He died for all of us. Regardless of your past, regardless of what you've done, he died for the sinner. And that means every one of us. Romans Five, six, and eight. We read this in our men's Bible study this morning. Romans five, verses six and eight, six through eight says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died knowing that you don't deserve it. He died knowing that, that you're a dirty person, that you sin, that you have sin in your life that makes us almost unreachable. And he knew that the only way that he could bridge that gap of sin in our life was to die on the cross for your sin. And his blood made a bridge between you and God. Before Jesus came, guess what? You had to go through a priest and that priest had to be clean. And if anybody got near the Ark of the Covenant, and they were unclean, guess what happened? They died. But when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was torn in two, and there's no man that stands between you and God ever again. You have free access to the Savior of the world, and all you got to do is ask him to be your Lord and Savior. It's that easy. He died for you. Aren't you glad that he offered us that kind of mercy when really we all deserve death? Y'all ever seen a house 
that was grown up in the city and it was grass grown up around it and the windows and doors are all boarded up and it has a sign on it that says condemned. Without Jesus, every one of us needs a sign around our neck that says condemned. We are all condemned to die. But when Jesus comes into our life, you know, I, I used the illustration in Sunday school this morning that when that house is condemned, what do they do to it? It gets deconstructed. It gets tore down. And then something new, something great gets built back in its place. When Jesus comes in your life, that condemned, is, condemned sign is ripped in two. And God begins to build something great in the place of the person that used to be there. The old you is gone. The new you is raised in Christ. Just like we saw in baptism this morning. Buried with Christ in death and raised to walk in newness of life. That's what happens. Romans 6.23 says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We keep Jesus out of our life and try to do it our own, and we let our guilt consume us. We could still face destruction, but Romans 6.23 tells us of that destruction, that the wages of sin is death. That is the destruction. And in order for you to claim the gift of God, all you have to do is confess your sin and confess your guilt and receive it. Confess that Jesus is Lord of your life and you will be saved. And yes, the old you, in a sense, will die and a new you, a new person, will be raised up in Christ. Jesus died for you and for me so that we could be free from sin. And we could be free from guilt. And we could be free from shame. And maybe today you've you're here and maybe you've been carrying guilt for a long time. Maybe you've been carrying shame for a long time. I don't know the circumstances of your life, but you do. And God knows the circumstances of your life. God knows what you've been through. God knows what you've done. And God offers forgiveness for you in spite of that. Whatever you're feeling and experiencing, he knows it. He's been telling you for a long time that you need to let it go. Necessity drove Jacob to send his boys back to Egypt. And for some of you, necessity drove you to church today. Because you needed something from God. You needed to hear a word from God. Whatever guilt you have been feeling, it has led you to this place today so that you can have repentance and full closure. Jesus didn't die on the cross so you could live feeling guilty and full of shame for the rest of your life. He died so that you could experience his mercy, his love, and his grace, and his compassion. He wanted you to know that he loves you and he forgives you so you could live a life that is bold, fierce in faith and enjoy the gift of the Holy Spirit and one day have eternal life in heaven. That's God's intent for every one of you. Every person in this world. He wasn't selective with it. It's for all of us. His grace is good enough for all of us. And some of you need to come to this altar today and lay whatever it is that you brought in here with you. Leave your guilt and your shame and your sin you've been hiding and carrying and you need to leave it right here at the foot of the cross. For Jesus to take that away from you. So don't carry it anymore. You can't do it on your own. You will keep carrying it and you will keep carrying the weight of that guilt just like these boys did for 21 years. You don't have to do that. Some of you may need a defining moment. Maybe you need to give your life to Jesus. Maybe you need to rededicate your life. Maybe you need to follow the example of Jesus and be obedient and follow and, uh, and be baptized so that you can have the old person that you were left in this water and you can be raised a new person in Christ no longer condemned some of you need to step up for your family today maybe your husband maybe your wife that you need to step up and you need to be the person that steps up to the plate like Judah did your family ain't going to start reading the Bible if you don't start first your family ain't going to start praying if you don't start first your family ain't going to come to know Jesus if you don't come to know him first and your family's not going to be with you in heaven if you don't give your life to Jesus first. It starts with you. If you want anything to change in your life, it starts with you. If you don't lead them to Jesus, are you willing to stand in the gap and stand up and step up to the plate for those that you love? Are you willing to do that today? Are you willing to stand up for Jesus because you're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? and proclaim that he is your Lord and Savior. Today, we all have a choice to make. Will you bow your heads with me? 
God, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for the story of Joseph, God, as we dig deeper into this week after week, Lord, and next week we find the full repentance comes as he reveals himself to his brothers. But God, today, my prayer is that today you revealed yourself to every person in this room, everybody that's watching online, God, I pray that you revealed yourself to them in a way that only you can. That no matter what we've done, no matter how much guilt we have, no matter how much shame we carry in our life, that we can forgive and be forgiven, Lord. That we don't have to carry it any longer. That we can lay it at your feet. You will carry that burden for us, God, because you died on the cross so that we wouldn't have to. So that we could just live freely, live bold lives in faith that you are the Son of God and confess to others that you are the Son of God. And so that they can see the difference in us. God, we're called to be salt and light. And I pray that every person in this room would desire that to be, that they would be salt and light in their family. They would be salt and light in their relationships. That they'd be salt and light in their, in their workplace. Everywhere they go, God, that they would see Jesus in us. God, I pray for whatever decisions need to be made today, that we would do it and we would do it boldly. Bless our time and the invitation, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand, please?